Hey guys, in this video I'm going to be showing you how to formally derive the equations of motion for an overdamped system, an underdamped system, and a critically damped system. So to do that, let's first consider a spring mass dampener system. Now a spring mass dampener system consists of, you guessed it, a spring and a dampener. And it's connected to, no big surprise, a mass. Right? And let's consider the equations of motion for this mass if it's given some initial displacement from its equilibrium and some initial velocity. So, to do that, let's consider this block sometime during its motion, at some time t, when it's moved a distance x from its equilibrium. So this distance here is a distance x, and here is when it's in its equilibrium. Let's consider the forces acting on it. So let's draw a free body diagram of our block when it's at its position x, and this is what it looks like. You're going to have a force from the spring resisting displacement, and that will be kx, right? And it's towards the left because you've moved it to the right. Now, dampeners resist velocity, which means then that because we've placed x towards the right, that means then that we've assumed that the block is traveling towards the right, which means that the dampener provides a force towards the left of cx dot. This is a property of the dampener. It acts very similar to a spring, but it resists velocity instead of displacement. Are there any other forces? Well, yes, you've got your gravity force and you've got your normal force, but I won't bother drawing them because they're not too important. Now we can use Newton's law to simplify this. We know that the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to your mass of your block times by your acceleration in your x direction, right? Which means then that the sum of forces is just going to be minus kx it's minus because it's acting towards the left, and we've assumed right is to be to the positive, uh, is, is positive, right? And minus cx dot, where x dot is, once again, you just your velocity. And this is going to be your net force. And that's going to be equal to your mass of your block times by your acceleration of your block, which is just your double derivative of your displacement, okay? So this is your equation of motion. I guess I can end the video here, huh? No, not really. This is in terms of derivatives. Well, that's not too useful to us. We really want to simplify this down a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify this and write it over here. I'm going to write this as x double dot plus cx dot plus kx plus kx is equal to zero once you move these terms over there. Notice that this is now just a second order homogeneous differential equation. And the beautiful thing about this is that this is something that's well covered in a lot of math classes. But that's okay. If you don't know how to do this, I'll follow it step by step. So what I'm going to do first, oh, there's an M over here. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to divide both sides by our mass. And that leaves us with the equation x double dot plus c on m x dot plus plus k on m x is going to be equal to zero. Notice I can do that because our mass isn't zero. Now, what I'm going to do now is rather than worry about solving this equation with three variables, k, m, and c, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a few terms to simplify the calculations out. I'm going to define, I'm going to define c on m to be equal to 2 zeta omega n. And I'm going to define k on m to be equal to omega n squared. At this point, we have no idea what omega n is, and we have no idea what zeta is. None whatsoever. For all we know right now, they're just constants. I'll, I'll be exploring the, the properties of these constants in later videos, but right now all we know about them is that they're just plain constants, and they're defined by, this, by these two formulas. Okay, so as such, what we can do is we can simplify this expression some more. We can write this as x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus um, omega n squared x, and that's going to be equal to zero. Now, it seemed quite arbitrary why we chose 2 psi omega n and omega n squared here, but I think you'll understand why we chose to define them these ways when we get into something called the characteristic equation, which I'm going to be covering real soon, so bear with me. Okay, so now it becomes a matter of trying to solve this piece just here. Now, this often I find confuses a lot of students. So in order to solve this, let's consider, let's take a minor side path 
and consider just a much simpler equation. Let's consider the equation 4x plus 1 is equal to 5. Now we know we can solve this by simply arranging to solve for x, you know, the standard algebra method. Alternatively, what we could do is we could check whether x is equal to 1 is a solution. And, 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 we just, and to determine whether it is a solution, we literally just plug it back into our equation and see what happens. So the left-hand side would be equal to 4 times by 1 plus 1, which is equal to 5, which is equal to your right-hand side. So in this really, really simple equation just here, um, you can tell that x equals to 1 is a solution. We're going to be applying a similar method towards our, our second-order differential equation just here. We're going to check whether e to the lambda t, whoops, let me fix this. Let's check whether, let's check whether x is equal to e to the lambda t is a solution. Right, so you can tell it's a similar method as the way we applied earlier. Right, what we're going to do, and by the way, lambda is just a constant. We, we're just, we just know lambda is a constant at this point. I'm defining it to be this way. Um, let's check whether this is a solution. And we check whether it's a solution by literally plugging it in. But we can't plug it in without knowing what x dot is. x dot would be lambda e to the lambda t, and x double dot would be lambda squared e to the lambda t. I'm going to plug this into here to find out whether this actually is a solution. So let's do that. We know when you plug it in, we're going to be left with lambda squared e to the lambda t plus 2 zeta omega n lambda e to the lambda t plus omega n squared e to the lambda t, and that must be equal to zero, right, if it's a solution. Now, at the moment, this isn't too simplified. There's no easy way to tell. So let's, subst let's, let's factorize an e to the lambda t out, and what we're left with is lambda squared plus 2 zeta omega n plus, oh, lambda, don't forget the lambda, plus omega n squared, and that must be equal to zero. So in order for this to be, in order for this to be a solution, that means that this must somehow be equal to zero. But e to the lambda t can never be equal to zero. So basically, one of these two things had to be equal to zero. Either e to the lambda t had to be equal to zero, or this beast in here must be equal to zero. But e to the lambda t can never be equal to zero. And to verify that, just, just think of any value of lambda t such that e to that power is equal to zero. You can't. No such number exists. So, so that means that this beast right here must be equal to zero. So let me write that out. That means that lambda squared plus 2 zeta omega n lambda plus omega n squared must be equal to zero. This is what we're forced to accept if this is a solution. And this right here has a really fancy name. It's called the characteristic equation, right? This is, this is what we call it. This is what the math nerds call it. It's the characteristic equation, right? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to solve this using um, our quadratic formula to find the values of lambda. So let's do that. We know that using the quadratic formula, I'm continuing this over here, by the way, lambda must be equal to minus b, which is minus 2 zeta omega n, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 2 zeta omega n squared, minus 4ac, which is omega n squared. And that's going to be all divided by 2a, which is just going to be 2 times 1. Easy, right? Fortunately, this simplifies out a whole lot. And this is the main reason why we chose to define these things the way we did, so that they simplify out a whole lot. So let's consider this. Let's, let's, let's distribute the denominator, and we're left with minus zeta omega n plus or minus the square root of, let's see, it'll be 4 zeta squared omega n squared minus 4 omega n squared. That's once you simplify the square root sign all divided by 2. Now, we can simplify this out a little bit more because we know that 4 omega n squared can be factored, right? And so we can write this as minus zeta omega n plus or minus 2 omega n, the square root, times epsilon, sorry, epsilon zeta squared minus 1, all divided by 2. Once again, this can be simplified out some more, and we're left with lambda must be equal to minus zeta omega n plus or minus omega n square root 
zeta squared minus 1. This, these are the values of lambda such that x is equal to lambda t is a solution to this equation. Now I want to draw your attention to the square root sign. You can tell that depending on the value of our zeta here, our roots can either be real and distinct, real and the same, or complex. Right? And depending on whether they're real and the same, real and distinct, or complex, our equation of motion will change. So to quantify this, let's consider each case separately. Let's first consider the case, let's first consider if zeta is less than 1. Well, if zeta is less than 1, then our roots will be complex. That's because the square root will be negative, right? Which means then, and as it follows, x must be equal to e to the minus zeta omega nt times by a, a is just some constant, times sine omega dt plus phi, where phi is also just some constant, right? This is our equation of motion. Follow this link, which I'm going to put in here, um, to find out why this is the case. Now, this is something we call underdamped. Under damped motion, right? That's because zeta is less than 1. We call that underdamped. Now let's consider the case where zeta is exactly equal to 1. Well, if zeta is equal to 1, that means the square root sign equals 0, which means that our roots are the same. And as such, it follows, and for a proof, go to this link, if zeta is equal to 1, then e is going to be equal to, sorry, x is going to be equal to minus omega nt times by a plus bt, where both a and b are just constants as well. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And this is something we call critically damped. Critically damped motion, right? This is under damped, this is critically damped. Let's deal with the final case where if epsilon, sorry, not epsilon, if psi is greater than 1, then it follows that x must be equal to e to the minus zeta omega nt times by a e to the omega n square root zeta squared minus 1 t plus b e to the minus omega n square root zeta squared minus 1 t. I hope I've got enough space in there so you can see it. There we go. And this is something we call, this is something we call overdamped motion. This is over damped motion just here. Now, before I go into showing you what an example of this type of motion is, let's just consider briefly what omega d is. I haven't told you what it is yet. Basically, I'm going to go to this link for a more thorough explanation, but we essentially define, we essentially define omega d to be equal to omega n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. This is a definition just here, right? This is a definition. Okay, now for a more thorough explanation, I suggest you go to this corresponding link. Now, let's consider an example of each of these individual cases. Under damp motion exists when zeta is, or our dampening ratio, is less than 1. And this is what our motion will look like. It will look like this. It will oscillate back and forth um, and uh, gradually, and our amplitude will plateau out according to an exponential relationship. Critically damped is the fastest to approach zero, and overly damped sluggishly returns to zero in its own time. I hope that makes sense. Now, as a final parting, I guess, gift to you, I've got this, I've, I've managed to type up what our over damp motion is, critically damp motion, and under damp motion is, if we were find out what the values of A and B are in each of these cases. Right? Um, and that's by using our boundary conditions, that it's got initial displacement of x0 and initial velocity of, of v0. Right? So pause the video and find out what this is, if you like. I hope that makes sense, guys. In the next video, I'm going to be showing you what um, uh, logarithmic decrement is.